Hopefully all you enjoyed that extra hour of sleep that you got to get. I was making a joke earlier that uh, I had to work. So as I was at work, I was looking at the clock and said 158, then 159, then one o'clock again. And I was making a joke to my boss and said, I had to do one o'clock, 1 a.m. twice. But then I was just thinking just now, what if we were able to do light over light like that? We were able to do an hour over again in our life. We were able to do a day over again in our life. The things that we would do differently, the things that we would change, the things we would probably say differently, how we would move differently. Just think about for a second if we had that ability to just turn back the hands of time for a minute. And the answer is we do. We don't turn back the hands of time, but God gives us the next day. Every morning we wake up, every morning that we breathe, we have another day to get right with God. Amen. And although we can't physically change the time, God gives us that ability to get it right. To move right, to praise Him right. You know, we, we, we tend to walk every day saying that we're going to praise God and worship God and treat this person right and do this right, but we tend to let our flesh get the best of us. So thank God today that he gives you another breath. Thank God that he gives us another day to do it again. Today you turn back the time one hour, but God gives us a whole another day to do it over if that's his option and he so chooses. Life is short. The Bible says life is not the butter vapor. So you have to cherish every day that you have, every day that you breathe, every day that you walk. Praise God and thank him for allowing you another opportunity to get it right. If you like the Old Testament, like I like the Old Testament, a lot of them did not have a chance to get it right. When you messed up, that was it. If you think about Saul's wife, uh, Lot's wife, he told her don't turn around, she turned around, bam, she was a pillar of salt. And just think about how simple God can take us off this earth if it wasn't for the grace of Jesus. Christ died on that cross. So today, I just tell you to praise God that he gives us another chance to do it again. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says let everything that has breath, praise the Lord.
on her very last breath. But the scripture says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. So how would you praise him if you on your last breath? How do you honor God with your praise? How do you honor him with your worship? Open up your heart to him and let him in. Open your eyes and see his glory. See his power working on the inside of you and around you. God, we promise, God, to give you praise, God, for the rest of our lives, God. For the rest of our days, we give you praise. Oh, oh, oh. For the rest of our days, we give you praise. Yes, we will. For the rest of our days, we give you praise. Somebody praise him. For the rest of my days, we give you praise. Pray, somebody say, let, let go. 
hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Father God. Glory to your name. You know the reason we do praise and worship? I think we've got it mixed up at this point in time, in this generation. I think we have it mixed up to where praise and worship is thought of as something to entertain the people that walk into the church. And while it may do that as a side effect, that's not the purpose of our praise and worship. If you ever want to be reminded of the purpose of our praise and worship, read the slide on the screen. Worship, it's all about Him. The reason we get up and come to church is not to be entertained. It is all about praising God. The words we were just speaking is to Him be what glory and dominion. To the Almighty God be the most highest glory that we could possibly give possibly give with the words from our mouth and we acknowledge the dominion to him he is the one that is in control God is the one that wakes you up every morning it wasn't your alarm clock still you it was God and if for nothing else just for the fact that he saw us good enough somehow saw it that we should be reconciled to him like, think about that for a moment. He saw something in you, in your sinful nature, that while you were sinning, he decided, you know what? I can be separated from those sinners forever. I'm holy. I don't have to deal with them. But I love them so much. He loves you so much that he decided he would send his son to die for your sins. So when you wake up in the morning and you drive yourself here to church, forget when you come to church. Every morning when you wake up, give God praise. Lift your hand in the air and give him praise because he is worthy. Oh, man, he's worthy. Praise team, thank you. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of your praise. He is more than worthy of my praise. Father God, as I stand here before you and before the church this morning, God, I pray that you would please reduce me as much as possible, God, and increase yourself in me, God, that the words that come from my mouth might please you, that I might not be here to please anybody else but you. And I pray, God, that you would open the hearts and the minds of those who are under the sound of my voice, that they may be receptive to the words that you have given it is in your name we pray, Father God. Amen. Amen, amen. So on this beautiful Sunday morning, I know that everybody's feeling refreshed, right? Because we all got that extra hour of sleep. How many of you sat up and watched the clock go from 1.59 back to 1 o'clock? Anybody? Oh, that means y'all took full advantage of that hour. That's what I like to hear. Sean stayed up and watched it from 1.59 back to 1 o'clock. But we should all be feeling a little bit more refreshed because you were blessed with an extra hour of sleep. Amen? You enjoyed it? All right, clap it up. We won't get it again for quite some time. So today I want to talk about the impact that one person can have on this world. The impact that one person can have on this world. When we think about the many people in historical times, and even in today's present time, us as a people, we are powerful. We're powerful. The decisions that we make every day, every moment, from the small ones up to the greatest ones, are powerful. They're impactful. And something that you choose to do today, believe it or not, could determine the entirety of the rest of the world. Now, not everyone is going to have in decisions that impact the world. But true enough, some of you, maybe even some of you in this church today, who knows? I like to believe that my daughter has the decisions that she will make that will impact the world. Now that's just a dad being proud of his daughter, really hoping that she does that. Maybe she'll come up with a cure for cancer or something like that. But I like to believe that she has the power, and I tell her that you've got the power to change the world. The decisions that we make have great impact. 
Think about some people such as Thomas Edison. 1,093 patents in his lifetime. Some of us don't have any. Some of us may never have any. Thomas Edison had 1,093 patents in his lifetime. He's responsible for the early version of motion picture. So when you watch movies, we can think back to Thomas Edison. Nobody's thinking that. You don't see that in the credits. But that was something that he had an impact on with his one life. No, he put on his pants the same way that I did every that I do every morning. But one person making decisions had an impact on the world. George Washington Carver developed over 300 uses of the peanut. If I was back in his time, I would look at the peanut and I would eat it. And that's only if somebody told me that I could eat it. With his brain, he was able to figure out 300 different uses of the peanut. One man, one mind. Just like you and I, but decisions that he made. He's credited with saving the agricultural economic e economy of the South at one point. Powerful decisions. Queen Esther in the Bible. Through her commitment to trust in God, she influenced the king and saved her people. One woman. Don't ever look in the mirror and say that I'm just one person. Don't ever look in the mirror and say that my life doesn't matter. Because the decisions you make, whether they impact the entire world or not, may just impact your neighbor. Somebody may be watching you go through a struggle. And they may base their behavior off of what they see in you. Don't believe me? Look at a child and look at a parent. That relationship is evident every day of one person's decisions and how they can impact somebody else. Now let's look on the negative side. Because one decision in one person can impact things for great good, can also be impacted for great negativity. Adolf Hitler, responsible for the death of six million some odd Jews. One person responsible for the death, the murder, the torture of over six million individuals. Some of us will never get to know, most of us will never get to know one million people. But this man single-handedly, through his influence, one mind, one person, decisions that he made affected the entire world and an entire race. Tom Brady, one man with one mind and one ability, seven Super Bowl rings, most passing touchdowns of all time. The list goes on and on. MVP credits. I mean, the most trips to the Super Bowl. A man of great accomplishments. Puts his pants on the same way I do every single day. One man. Great accomplishments. We look at someone like the impact that Lady Michelle had on this world. Responsible for organizations such as Left Hand Ladies. Where she would guide and impact and, and and mentor married women in keeping their covenant and in being strong wives and being a powerful woman and having the back of their husbands. One woman carrying on the legacy of her father in EKO, Every Kid Outreach, impacting teams all around Central Florida. Motivating women through, motivating women through something called The Dressing Room, a book that she wrote and also something that she did on a regular basis, an activity where she would invite women and I was never there, but I know it has something to do with the impact of you looking in the mirror and figuring out who you are and how you impact the world as a woman. Thousands of people are still impacted by what she did on this earth. One woman, one mind, but the decision she made impacted the entire Central Florida, the state of Florida, and her impact goes to several different countries. But she was no different in her ability than you and I were. One person. Your one life is powerful, is the point that I'm trying to make. Don't you ever sit down and with the rate of suicide that we have in this world amongst teens, amongst children, amongst adults. You know, when you reach a point of suicide, and thank God I've never been to the point of committing it, obviously I would not be here. But I believe that there's a feeling of hopelessness. And you decide to end your life because you believe that no matter what you do, 
things will not get better. And that you have no impact on this world and no purpose. And that's a lie directly from the pits of hell. Directly from Satan. Because if he can accomplish something as great as taking God's people off this earth by causing them to end their own lives, then what work does he have to do? But it reaches a point in people's lives sometimes where they feel like they don't have an impact on this world. And I tell you, my brothers and sisters, that nothing could be further from the truth. Your one life has a great impact. The decisions that you make have great impact. Every decision that you have made in the past has put you where you are right now. Think about that. Where you are today, your current financial situation, whether you're married or not, whether you have children, whether what kind of job you have, what kind of clothes you have in your closet, what kind of car you drive, are somewhat, mostly, almost fully impacted by decisions that you and I have made. And I like to say that the decisions we made in the past affect where we are in the present. The decisions that we make in the present, guess what? Affect where we will be in the future. So there's no use of sulking in the decisions that you've made that have brought you where you are. Instead, reflect on those things, use those things to help you make more powerful decisions today. You're still alive. The decisions you made didn't end you. So you still have an opportunity as long as you're taking a breath in these seats, you still have an opportunity to change your outcome by the decisions that you will make today and going forward. Your life is powerful. So I would call this sermon today the power of one. Very simple. The power of one. The power of one. The power of one. Today what we're going to do is we're going to compare and contrast the power of two very impactful individuals and how their lives and their decisions made an impact on the world that you and I live today. Those two people are Adam and Jesus. Both lived two very different lives. Both lived human lives. Both had opportunities to obey or disobey. Both had the opportunities to make decisions. And with one man's decision, it affected all of humanity. With another man's decision, it affected all of humanity. Let's pull up Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Very simple verse, but very impactful. And it reads, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Like, let's stop and just... Think about that for a moment. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. When you think about all the negative things that go on in this world, the things that we watch on the news, the murders, the rapes, the crimes, or on a more local level, when someone steals something from you. Anybody ever had their car broken into? Woken up to that shattered glass on the ground? Right? The crimes, the sin, someone lying against you, someone gossiping against you. Someone doing things that hurt your feelings some way, somehow. All powered and accredited to one thing. Sin. Like when we think about the cruelty that goes on in this world, it all boils down, I don't care what type of crime it is, it all boils down to sin. This is telling me that all of that came when when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. You know, if I ever have a chance to go to heaven, not if I have a chance, when I have a chance to enter into those gates, I think I'll go talk to Adam. And I think I have a friendly conversation with Adam. Like, man, Adam, you know, we made it. We're here now. Like, everything's all good. You know, we praise the Lord here in the presence of God. Like, we're good now. But, man... You don't know what you put me through for the time that I lived on earth. All because of one sin. So Adam is to blame for sin entering the world. However, don't you dare for one moment put your nose down and look down on Adam. Don't you do it. 
Because I would argue that every single person in this church, with the exception of Miss Jackie and Pastor Bella, would have done the exact same thing that Adam did. You know why? Anybody ever seen a wet paint sign? What does the little kid inside of you want to do? Be honest. You want to touch it. Like, it's not that you don't believe it's wet. You just got to see, man. Like, I need to know if this is really, maybe it dried by now. Maybe I can help them by helping them take down this side. They're misleading us. Let me touch this wet paint sign. Or if you see a sign on the door that says, do not enter. The complexity that starts to go on in your mind. But why? Like, what, what's, like what they got in there that I, we need to put a do not enter sign on the front of the church doors. <laughs> that might make some great impact. But it's something about that do not that just intrigues us. We got to do it. Don't believe me? Look at a baby. Innocent baby. Little savages. Little evil creatures, man. You know, it's funny we laugh. But have you ever looked at that little evil face? When they're just screaming and crying and spitting up and snot coming out their nose and they're swinging their hands. I mean, I'm talking about when they're tiny. You ever looked at that little evil face <laughs> and just <laughs> wanted to do some things, but you know that your conscience and the reality of jail time just wouldn't allow you to do these things? Look, I got a daughter. I love her to death. To death. But I'm telling you, I remember seeing her scream and cry as a baby and just looking at her and just saying, what have I done? Like, I got to deal with this for the next 18 years of my life. And it doesn't change much. They just do different things as they get older. <laughs> but the point that I'm making is you look at that little child. Imagine that child in that state of fury. Having long legs, long arms, and being able to walk and do what they wanted to do. It's a little scarier now, isn't it? It's only because we've guided them and showed them things that are right and wrong that they now have that ability. But had they not been guided, that rage inside, and you're born with it. We've all screamed and yelled at our parents, crucified them and cursed them in our Gaga language because they didn't give us our pacifier. Some of us still today scream, angry, mad, do things in rage and anger because we don't have our pacifier, whatever that may be for you. But we look back and I say that Adam caused sin to enter the world. Let's take a little lapse, in the, little, little, what do they call it? Blast to the past, a little trip down memory lane. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's take a little trip down memory lane. Uh, GB, put up Genesis 2, uh, chapter 8 through 9 for me. And let me get there. First book in the Bible, so it shouldn't be hard for you to find without a marker. There we go. Genesis chapter 2, 8 through 9. Look, we're going to run through this really quickly because I want to make sure that we get an understanding of, like I say when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, but we have to understand how that came about. Genesis 2, 8 through 9 says, now, before all this, God created the earth, he created the sky, created the waters, created all the animals, created all these great things, and we had a beautiful earth. Everything was beautiful. And then God decided, in verse 8 of chapter 2, Then the Lord planted a garden in Eden, in the Eden, in Eden in the east. And there he placed the man he had made, Adam. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God made this beautiful garden, after he made this beautiful world and then put this beautiful man in the beautiful garden. Perfect scenario. If we could go back to it right now, I'm sure we all said, man, I wouldn't blow that. But that's only because you have the knowledge that we have now. Adam didn't have that knowledge of what would be caused by his actions. So that's the world that he was put in. That's God's blessings, right? Right? the beautiful land of Eden. It's a blessing that he gave. 
Fast forward down chapter 2, verses 15 through 18. And the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. One job, Adam. But the Lord God warned him, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, except, wet paint sign, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. God gave Adam specific instructions. Not just instructions, but he also told him what would happen if you disobey those instructions. So I have Adam in a beautiful place. I've got Adam given instructions. And I've got Adam given the consequences of his sin. Should he decide with his free will that God blessed him with to do the wrong thing? Well, we all know how this story goes. In Genesis 3, fast forward. Now, this is a very interesting dialogue. Most of us read this as just something in the Bible and maybe just a documentary. I read it like a soap opera. There's drama in this. And when you really look at it, like, it's good. It's real good. Look, we're going to go through this 1 through 13, chapter 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? I can imagine he said it just like that. Like, did he really say you can't eat everything? And then Eve said, well, of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Ah, oh, he goes, say, you won't die? Did he say you were going to die? No, you're not going to die. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it. And you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. That's it. The woman was convinced. That's all it took. Simple temptation. That's all it took. And the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and the fruit looked delicious. So she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. She took some of the fruit and ate it. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Now, chapter verse 6 says the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful. And it looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took of the fruit and ate it. It was when she gave some to her husband that verse 7 tells us at that moment. Somebody said, we can't blame Eve. It was Adam that was given the instruction. It was Adam that decided. He wasn't tricked. He was decide. He made a decision. He decided to eat the fruit. And so he ate it. And at that moment, their eyes were open and suddenly they felt shame of their nakedness. All of a sudden, they feel shame. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Rhetorical question. Pause. God knew they eat from the fruit. I'm giving you an opportunity to tell me what you did. The man replied, like any other man would reply, I would have did the same thing. It was the woman who gave me the fruit. It wasn't me. God, you know me better than that. Come on, we've been here since Adam. You know me from Adam. It, was, it wasn't me. It was the woman. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and I ate it. So then the Lord turns to the woman and says, what have you done? She played the same game. The serpent deceived me, she replied. Do y'all see the, the, the pointing of fingers? Adam gets accused. It was the woman. The woman gets accused. No, no, no. It was that serpent. And we still do this to this day. Look at a group of kids and tell them that you did something. They will point to the person next to them without even looking to see who it is. It wasn't me. It was them. We carry that on to this day. So we had deception. We had disobedience. As a result of this now, the garden that was once the beautiful place that we resided in and lived in 
with no sin of our own. We weren't out here being sinful. But Adam. Genesis 3, chapter, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Then he said to the woman, this is what you get as a result. I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire control over your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to, to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Let me pause right there. God had no reason to make them animal skins at that point in time. Like, they deserved to walk around naked. They deserved to walk around uncomfortable. And I say uncomfortable because fig leaves, if any of you have ever seen a fig leaf, it's not a very comfortable thing to put on your body. It has little hairs on it. It gets hard after time. I would imagine you have to change it over and over again. Like, they deserve to have to live that type of a life. But God has been in the covering business since day one. And God is still in the covering business to this day. How many of you have been exposed for everything you've ever done? Oh, you've been covered, huh? You've been covered. Right? If it was to come to light, everything that you've done, Take it off of you guys for a moment. If it were to come on to light everything that I've done, none of you would even want to listen to me. But God has covered me. And he covers each and every one of you. So just that same way, he covered them. He made them clothing from animal skins. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take the fruit from the tree of life and eat it. Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden. Eden and he sent Adam to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. We lost the beautiful garden of Eden. We gained sin, corruption, evil, lies, murders, rapes, theft, abuse. Whatever you've done, we gain that. Whatever I've done, we gain that. We gain sin all because of one man. One man's decision. One man impacted the entire world. So now when we go back and we read Romans 5, and we go to chapter 12, and it's, uh, chapter, uh, verse 12, and it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. You should have a more close understanding of how impactful the sin that entered the world really is and the impact that it has on you and I each and every day. So it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought what? Death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes. People sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. And he's talking about before Moses got the law, that the sin wasn't really imputed against them as it is after they received the law, after you've been given the knowledge. When that baby is screaming and crying, we don't go whoop them because they threw something on the ground. They don't know what they're doing. So we don't count it wrong against them. Is it still wrong? Sure it is. Sure it's still messed up that I got to do with you hitting here screaming and crying and acting the fool in the middle of, uh, of the supermarket. But I'm not going to punish you for it because you don't know any better. However, you tried that when you're 10 years old. And we got a whole different ballgame because now you know right from wrong. And I'll still give you grace from time to time. But you know right from wrong at that point. So it was not counted as sin 
because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even though those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, who was yet to come. We inherited sin, and some may say, well, it's not fair. It's not fair that I have to take the sin of what Adam did. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. But I can tell you that your decision wouldn't have been any different. Why? Because you have this that tells you right from wrong. Raise your hand if you get up and don't sin every day. That cricket sound, that was perfect. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I really didn't play in it. We sin every single day, so we can't blame Adam. We can and we can't. We would have done it. You have the word of God that says do not steal. We still steal. It says don't fornicate. We still fornicate. It says don't lie. We still lie. So if you were in that garden and God put the wet paint sign on the tree, you would have touched it. Because that curiosity that kills the cat affected all of mankind. Adam's decisions affected the entire world. We inherited sin as a result of Adam's decision. He was the first father besides God that we had on this earth and we're all a part of that bloodline. We inherited this sin. Whether you feel like you deserve it or not, it's yours. You don't get to choose what hereditary things are passed on from your mother. You don't get to choose. I didn't get to choose that I'm bald. No. My mom's family is bald. I didn't choose this. But I inherited it. And it's not fair. And I can complain all I want to. But it's mine. Your sin is yours. You inherited it. Whether you feel it. Stop laughing. At me. Moved on. You inherited that sin. However, the impact that one man had on this world that should have crushed us all and should have left us to death. Oh, there was this other man. Somebody say other man. Other man. There was this other man that God sent to reverse what the one man did. He sent someone else to save us. And what I would say is the guilt that was gained in the garden was crushed by what Christ did on the cross. We gained a lot in that garden. Curses, death, banishment from the garden of Eden. We gained all of that. But man, what Christ did on the cross absolutely reversed it and banished it. Never to make me guilty of those sins ever again. Ever, ever again. We go to verse 15. Now we're going to contrast to what Jesus did. We know what Adam did. Look at what Jesus did. Verses 15 to 17 say, Oh, but there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, to us. Oh, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness, his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man. Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Somebody say not guilty. But you committed the crime. Somebody say not guilty. not guilty. But I've got evidence that proves that you were there that day.
Amen. Somebody say, not guilty. not guilty. But I've got your thumbprints on the murder weapon. I've got people that saw you there that day. And the enemy stands accusing you. And you were there that day. But that is the impact and the power. I don't know if any of you have ever been in court fighting for your life. When you committed the crime, you deserve to go to prison. I don't care if you're family. I don't care how much I love you. I don't care if you're my own flesh and blood. If you committed the crime, you deserve the penalty. Thank God that his viewpoint is a little different than ours. We committed the crime. We were guilty. We were there that day. But God, for some reason, saw it fit to say, oh, how I love this creation that I've made. I will send someone to be a sacrifice. Imagine being in court and your whole life is going away because of whatever you did. The verdict has been read. The penalties are being read on how many multiple life sentences you're going to do. And then right before the judge gets ready to slam that gavel, somebody says, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We've got one more witness. And in walking through the door comes Jesus. And oh, judge, they deserve to be crucified. Oh, judge, they deserve to be put in jail. They deserve every penalty that you're going to give them. However, if you will allow me, take me instead. Put me on that cross. Put the nails in my hand that they deserve. You know those nails that Carter deserves, Brother Willie deserves, Pastor Jay deserves, Randy deserves? Put them in my hand. Give me the spear in, the, in my side. Put the whips on my back. Because God sent me to die for you. And just like that, he took all the sins. That one witness that entered the courtroom at the last minute undid everything that Adam did in the garden. He took all the sin, all the cruelty, but most importantly, he took the penalty that you and I were supposed to get. What is that penalty? Death. What does that death really mean? Separation from God. Darkness. Eternity separated from the creator of the universe. That was, that's what we were supposed to get. But Jesus said, not on my watch. Give it to me. I'll take it. I didn't do it, but I'll take it. They deserve it, but I'll take it. And in the final verses here, it shows that yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Praise God for new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. Oh, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. And this part I just don't get. But as people sin more and more and more and more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. I don't get that. Because even me as my child decides to be disobedient more and more, I give her more and more disciplinary action. Because I've got to make sure I train her up in the right way. God says, 
said, although you sin more and more, right? Let's take it out of past tense. Although you sin more and more right now, you'll walk out of here and sin. Oh, you're going to walk out of here and sin. More and more and more. But God's grace is even much more abundant. That when you don't deserve it, his grace and his blood is that much more powerful than the sin that you committed. Somebody asked, do I have to get saved over and over and over again? I would say this. For you to have to be saved over and over and over again just because you sinned again diminishes the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It diminishes that power. Because if Adam's one sin was so powerful that it covered all of us in death and in separation from God. His one sin, he's a man, he's human. Don't you dare tell me that the blood of Jesus Christ is not powerful enough to cover you all the days of your life. If one man's sin could cover the entire world, then surely one man, Jesus' sacrifice and blood shed on Calvary is enough to cover all of your sins. So I say to you that once you have accepted that gift of salvation, if you have genuinely accepted it, you've accepted it for good. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that None should perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Have what? Everlasting life. And I love hearing Pastor Jay talk on this. Because if something is everlasting, that means it lasts forever. Meaning if his blood is so powerful that it's everlasting, that when I walk out of here and lie, it doesn't go away. His blood is that powerful. Now, I won't break the door open into next week's message. But it does go into saying that, well, then should we keep on sinning so that God should show us more and more grace? Of course not. I won't break open that door, but I got to at least give you a peek to know that that doesn't mean walk out of here and just be a savage like that baby. We know better. We've been taught better. And when you know better, you what? You do better. Let me read the rest of this. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What I have to tell you today is that the crime that was committed in the garden, the sin, was powerful enough to cast us all out from Jesus' presence. But God saw it fit to send a Savior to die for you and I so that our sins, our blemishes could be made right. Don't you ever think it's because of anything you did? Because just like that crying baby, you're still evil on the inside. We were imputed that sin. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ that makes you holy and makes you righteous. Yes, I declare to you today that you are holy. You are righteous. But it's only because of the blood of the Lamb, the final sacrifice, the blood that was shed on Calvary for you and for me. So what I'll say next, and then I'll close, is that that gift of salvation is only given to those who take the gift. And I don't know what your personal spiritual relationship is with Christ. And I personally don't need to know. You need to know. So to each of us sitting in this church this morning, to each of you watching online, you need to know that you're given this gift of grace that Jesus Christ so freely gives to you. You know, the one that cost him everything. 
but he gives to you for nothing, for free, because God loves us. Make sure you know what your relationship is with him. And if you don't, if you don't feel like you've taken advantage of that gift, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. My name is Randy Lorelock. You can find me that way on Messenger. I'm sure somebody will tag me at some point. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, send me a one-on-one -on -one message in confidence. I will take the time out of my day, out of my week to make sure that we talk and make sure that that is extended to you. But understand, it's not going to be from me extending it to you that gives you the grace. It's going to be from you accepting the gift that gives you the grace. Father God, we come before you today and I just want to give you thanks and praise. Lord, I pray for that man and that woman right now who don't have that relationship with you. I pray, I pray that you would replace their heart of stone with a heart of flesh. That you would soften their hearts right now. And that you would speak to each and every one of them, Father God, so that they may hear your voice. And that they would knock on the door. And I believe that as your word says, that anyone that knocks, you'll be standing at the door waiting. I thank you for your grace and mercy. And I thank you for the gift that you gave us that saved us from the penalty that we deserve. Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For those of y'all that are watching online, I want you all to give Minister Randy some likes, some hearts for such a great message. Those of y'all that ain't here today, let's give Mr. Randy a hand clap. Brilliantly articulating the good news that we see in Romans. You know, he said so many great things today, and I love the way he just walked through Romans chapter five uh, uh, in such a in such a great in such a great way. Um, but one of the things that, he's, that, that stood out is when he, when he spoke to how sin is hereditary. And um, he used a great analogy uh, talking about how he had, like, he, he can't do anything about the fact that he's bald. Um, that it, 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 he, was, it was born, he was born that way, it was, like, it was handed to him. It's his mom and his dad's fault of the bald hereditary gene that is inside of him tried to grow his hair back, couldn't, because it's just it's in there. Uh, but sin is the same way. We're born, I know I'm terrible, we're born, we're born in it, shaped in it, molded in it, and we, we are great, grateful for the gift of grace that was extended to us by what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. Brilliant, 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 brilliant message on today. I put it in, in the Facebook group chat as well. Just, just brilliant, along with a couple nuggets. I, I wanna, I wanna give you all two principles as we prepare our hearts and our minds to worship the Lord and given. I wanna give you all two, two principles that we see in Scripture in relation to giving. Two principles. All right. And I want, if you all don't know these principles, to take these principles down in your notes, in your phones, on your notepads. Um, everybody, everybody, everybody. Musicians, everybody. Y'all can pause the music just for a second. The boy's good. Um, just so everyone can take these two simple principles down in relation to giving. Because given is expression of our worship, that it is important for us to really take our time in understanding this aspect of worship. We got the singing down pat, right? Praise him and the band rock out. We got the preaching down pat, the assembling. We're still trying to get the fellowship assembling stuff down pat. 
Um, but then one of the one of the problems that many of us face in relation to our worship towards God is the area of giving, giving. Um, so two principles that I jotted down. I was listening to a pastor for the last couple of weeks do a brilliant job on teaching, and he happened to be teaching on giving. And principle number one is always a portion. Principle number two is sometimes a sacrifice. Number one, always a portion. Say always a portion. Always a portion. Two, say sometimes a sacrifice. For those of y'all that are watching online, I don't want you to be left out right now. I want you to type in always a portion, number one. Number two, sometimes a sacrifice. Throughout the entirety of the Bible, it was always customary for God's people to give a portion of what they had back to God. This is traced throughout the entire Bible to where when God blessed his people, his people in return always gave a portion back to God. In Genesis 14 verse 20, we're told that Abraham, after they had won the war, he gave a tenth to God. He gave a portion back to God. And what's unique about Abraham's gift back to God is he didn't need, it, need a law to tell him to do it. He didn't need anyone to compel him to do it. He didn't need anyone to urge him to do it. He didn't need anyone to make him to do it. Like, what's unique about Abraham's gift to God when you really think about it, predating the law is that the moral compass that he had to want to give God a portion came from inward. It was something that just happened on the inside of him. And he recognized that it was God that gave him the victory and so God deserved the portion of the spoils. And so when we say always a portion, it is important for us to know that throughout the entirety of scripture, God's people always gave a portion of their giving, of their, of their gifts back to the Lord. But even when you fast forward to the New Testament, it's crazy because you, you, don't, see a, you don't see a change take place with always a portion, this principle. In fact, you see in the New Testament, the believers going beyond what we saw highlighted in the Old Testament. So Abraham, prior to the law, gave a portion. Moses included it in the law to give a portion. And now that Jesus has fulfilled the law, we see a greater portion. This, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is in your Bible. So what do we know for sure? We know unequivocally, unequivocally, without a doubt, three things. One, Christians should allocate a portion of their income that they commit back to the local church. Christians should allocate a portion of their income that they commit to their local church. Number two, God expects you to allocate whatever it is that you're going to give to him first. These are three things that must be communicated on the record. Christians should give a portion of their income to their local church. Christians should give that portion to God first. And number three, it should happen regularly, meaning all the time. There's a couple passages of scripture, Proverbs 3, verses 9 through 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting. But honor the Lord with your wealth. Everybody say wealth. Now, it's ironic when we think of wealth that we can point to so many other people regarding the word wealth. 
Like, automatically, when I think of wealth, I think of people like Elon Musk. Apparently, I, I, I don't know how factual this is, but Elon Musk can give a couple billion dollars to every person in the United States, spend a billion dollars for the next 153 years, and he's still not run out of money. That's a lot of money. Or we think of Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, billionaire. Back when we were growing up, it was Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Those were billions that they make have nothing in comparison to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. So we automatically think of them, we think of wealth. But I want to submit to you all today that you might be more wealthy than you give yourself credit for. There may be some areas in your life that you've just not really tapped into that can produce the type of wealth. Uh, uh, I'm not suggesting the wealth of Jeff Bezos or that God wants you rich. I don't ever want you to misconstrue my message. But I do want you to know that you're a lot more wealthier than you think you are because in many instances, wealth has a lot to do with our state of mind. How we manage and handle the things that God has already blessed us with. See, the principle that I outline, always a portion, sometimes a sacrifice, is applied in your day-to-day -day life already. It is only when we start talking about it in relation to the local church or to God that we get uptight. But we give a portion of our income, like I mentioned to you all last week, I give a portion of my income to, to, to Longhorn Steakhouse. Get that porterhouse steak. They get a portion of my income. I give a portion of my income to the Geneva School when I pay 2J's tuition. Or to the Prodigy Academy when I pay Madison's tuition. When I go to the movies, I give AMC a portion of my income. I have no problem with giving those people a portion of my income. Because I see what I gain in return for giving them a portion. I think many of you all don't understand what you gain in return by being sold out in the area of worship for God. And because you don't fully grasp or understand, you hold on tight to what you think is yours, but it's not yours in the first place. Because every good and perfect gift comes from Above comes from God. And so everything that you and I currently possess, it is because God has given us grace enough to be able to possess it. Deuteronomy 8 and 18 says this. God has given you the health to go out and get wealth. So even for those that have gone out and made a wealthy living for themselves, it is only because God woke them up that morning. Because he didn't have to wake him up that morning. What did Jesus say to the rich young ruler who wanted to come follow him? He said, hey, I, I, I got something for you. You want to follow me? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and sell all that you currently possess. I want you to give all of the earnings to the poor. And then I want you to come on and follow me with everything that you got left, up, left over. And the guy was not able to follow Jesus. I don't think he was able to, wasn't able to follow Jesus because he didn't like Jesus' message or he didn't identify with Jesus' message. Or I don't think he didn't follow Jesus because he didn't think Jesus was a good guy or that there was some truth to what Jesus was saying. All of those things could have been the truth. But he loved the stuff more. And Jesus indicted him because he loved him, his stuff more than he loved Jesus. The Bible says this in relation to our giving. It says, where your heart, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. I can tell what you love based on where you put your portion. For those of you all that are watching right now, we can tell what you love based on where you put your portion. So the principle of giving is always a portion. Like we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, the Bible says this. On the first day of week, on the first day of the week, each of you 
to do what? Set aside a portion of your income. Well, how often does Paul tell the church to do it? He says the first day of the week. So how often should they do it? How many first days of the week there is? How many first days of the week are there in, the, in, in our calendar? 52. 52. So upon the first day of the week, we have the responsibility to lay aside a portion of our income based on what we what we know is coming in. All right, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. All right, I got to lay aside what I'm going to commit to give it to God first. If you give it to him second, then that means he's not first. All right? So whatever you have coming in from a budgetary perspective, whatever you have coming in, uh, uh, income from doing hair, income from work, income from uh, the pale grant, um, student loan, all of that stuff. You know, you know, we get that money from them grants from for school. It, was, uh, it used to be called the pell grant when we were in school. You know, that's income for a lot of us, right? It's it's only not income when I tell you to give it to the church. That's when it's no longer income. But any other time, it's income. Um, income tax, right? We lay aside a portion of what we gain every week or however often you get paid and we allocate, all right, this is what I'm going to commit to the local church. This is what I'm going to commit to this. This is what I'm going to commit to that. And then you set, set up your budget that way. That's the first principle, always a portion. Second principle, sometimes a sacrifice. Meaning there, there are times in scripture that God, for some reason, uniquely requires his people to go above and beyond into this area called sacrifice. Now, this is the problem with sacrifice. We think because we always give a portion that we're sacrificing. Always a portion of what belongs to God anyway. So when you don't give the portion that belongs to him, you are stealing. See, it's like if I get up and I say, you know, Man, God's grace saved us, and while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Woo, woo, pastor. Always a portion. Not giving him his portion means you're stealing. Wait a minute now, pastor. We got to talk after church. What I'm telling you is the two principles of giving that I want highlighted today for Christians everywhere, not just in the United States, always a portion. We should always set aside what we're going to give to God first. Now, if we look at our budget and we see more on fast food than more kingdom giving, then that says something about our hearts. I like Steakhouse, Colby's. That's why I'm gaining weight right now. I like that stuff. I went, I went to the store yesterday and had to get Jermaine and Madison some warm clothes. Because it's getting cold outside. I love my babies. I'm, I, I, like, I, they got to have warm clothes. But then I look at the church and I see all these needs around the church. Because you all do the same thing. You see the needs of your children. You see the needs of your family member. Somebody can call you right now and say, hey, man, listen, I'm struggling right now. And we're going to do our best to try to help them meet their needs. That's the God on the inside of us. Continue to do that. But there are some needs around this local church that need immediate attention. Immediate attention. And the only way the attention, only way those needs are met is if we come alongside each other to help meet the needs. And what I'm saying is, that's when it goes into sacrificial giving. That's when it goes, that, that's when it goes beyond, alright, Pastor Jay, I've already set aside a portion of my income that I'm committed to the local church. Now you're asking for something different. And I'm saying yes. In, in some instances, I will do that. And, and, and I think we're in that season right now. Alright? Well, I, I shared with you all last year, and, and remember, we're going to have a church meeting next week, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., before service. Uh, re, re, um, I told you all last week um, as we close out this last quarter of the year we've been behind on payroll for about three pay periods um, so I, I, I can come up here week after week and make you all think that everything is cool 
and we can preach till we blew in the face, sing, dance, got the musicians back here, and, 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 and all of that stuff. But I would be doing you all in the church a disservice by not letting you all know the reality of what's going on. And I'm saying as we close out this 2021 season, I'm going to ask that we sacrifice a little bit more in the area of giving for this particular local church and, 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 and at, along with the sacrifice in the area of giving, I'm asking that you all sacrifice more of your time to be present in Bible study on Sunday. And for those of you all that are watching online, get to church. Stop sitting on your couches every Sunday morning when the church is assembled back together. If you go to the grocery store, you should get up and get to church on Sunday morning. If you're going to work every day, get up and come to church on Sunday morning. There's an area of scripture where it talks about uh, preachers having a responsibility to compel people. That's my attempt today. To compel you in the area of giving and to get up and be present in church. Prior to, to the pandemic, I thought we were going to have to go to an additional service because our attendance was increasing drastically. The giving was going up. And, and, and now you, you see like a, a decline taking place. And, and, and I'm challenging you all as the church to get up and get to church on Sunday morning. On Wednesday nights, be at Bible study via Zoom and to, and to sacrifice in the area of giving as we close out this year and we enter into the year 2022. There's some great things on the horizon that we want to be able to do, but they will only be ideas if we don't have the resources to back up those particular ideas. So thank you all for indulging me for the last 15 minutes in relation to this. I want you all to honor the Lord in your giving through Easy Tithe, Cash App, PayPal, Check, Cash, whatever it is that you decide to do. Now, listen, I, I also want to say this. I'm not saying by you doing this that God is going to give you a new house tomorrow. Right? Now, I, and I want to be honest. Now, I want to be completely transparent in the area of giving that in the scripture, we're mandated to give. Just like we're mandated to praise the Lord, be obedient, honor God, honor our parents. We are mandated to give. That is in your Bibles. Read it. That's in your Bibles. But at the same time, I don't want to, I don't want to miscommunicate the message either. Like, I'm not saying God's going to give you a new house tomorrow. I'm not saying that your student loan debts are going to be paid off tomorrow, that some check is just going to magically appear in the mail. I'm not suggesting any of that stuff. We do know that that has happened in many people's lives, but I'm not saying that that is the motivation for us giving. The motivation for us giving is because the scripture tells us to do so. Always a portion, sometimes a sacrifice. Father, I thank you so much for the giving that we're about to receive. I pray, pray that it will be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom and not our many kingdoms. That it will be used to build the kingdom of God and not redeeming light center church. That it will be used to bring honor and glory to your name, not to make us celebrity pastors and ministers. God, I pray that whatever it is that we will receive, that you would give the increase. God, and I look forward to the great things that you're about to do in our lives as a result of our obedience to you in the area of giving. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, um, announcements. I don't, I don't know that we have any major announcements other than next Sunday, 10 a.m., church, church meeting. Um, lasts for about 30 minutes. Don't, won't take a long time. Um, so I want you all to make sure you all are present for that. For those of you all that are watching online, I want you here next Sunday, 10 o'clock, and I want you all present, like present, present. Any additional announcements that I'm failing to remember at this time? Nothing? Cool beans. Let's go ahead and stand up. Let's go ahead and prepare our hearts and our minds for dismissal. Father, we thank you so much for this day. This has truly been the day that you have made, and we continue to rejoice and be glad in it. When we leave here today, we leave here rejoicing because we serve such a great God. Thank you, God, for being so awesome in our lives. As Minister Randy uh, uh, articulated today, 
saving us from our sin. Wow. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God, for giving us the privilege to be able to worship you in the area of giving. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you till we meet again. Let the people of God say amen.